China's whole strategy is to isolate the Philippines, isolate Australia with their economic coercion, isolate Japan by not accepting uh, their fish to be exported. Our strategy is to flip that strip and make the isolated party China. They're the ones that are uh, isolated in the South China Sea as it relates to the Philippines. They're the ones that are isolated when it comes to trying to uh, use economic coercion to coerce Australia to change their posture. And they become the isolated party, which is why they throw in the towel on that effort. The U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, there speaking to us as Prime Minister Fumio Kishida prepares to meet with President Biden at the White House. And the South China Sea is expected to be top of the agenda when Kishida and Biden hold security talks on Thursday with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. So Biden and Kishida said to meet on Wednesday today as well before that. But let's get a bit more analysis on what this all means. Joseph Gregory Mahoney is with us from Shanghai. He's a professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University. Uh, you know, first and foremost, Professor, thanks very much for joining us. How important and significant is this meeting in your eyes? And how do you think Beijing is going to respond to it? Well, you know, I think, we, of course, we had to put it in the context of the recent uh, Yellen visit, which was trying to promote some sort of uh, positive image uh, uh, with respect to bilateral ties. But, you know, there's always this, you know, one step forward, two or three steps backwards uh, that we see from the U.S. whenever there's this sort of uh, positive outreach to China. And uh, I think, you know, clearly uh, what we're seeing here with uh, the meetings with Philippines and Japan um, is this uh, effort to uh, really uh, establish uh, uh, once and for all, certainly with uh, the Marcos uh, uh, presidency, uh, which has uh, been much more amenable to Washington than his, than his predecessors, um, to, to establish once and for all this uh, U.S. Uh, strategy, uh, which, which appears to be dr uh, driven by uh, the, the need to sustain um, uh, um, uh, military uh, uh, capacities in uh, uh, on China's borders, including the South China Sea. And one of the things that we're, that we're not really told about uh, from the U.S. side is the extent to which its militarization of the South China Sea, including, uh, including uh, incredibly dangerous and destabilizing actions by nuclear submarines, some of which we've learned about through accidents, have led China uh, to take a stronger position there uh, above water. And of course, the irony here is that you know before we started seeing these meetings uh, that, that are that are coming now, um, you know the, the, the longstanding history had had, had been uh, that uh, no, no other uh, that that, that uh, in, in terms of the Philippines history, uh, the U.S. and uh, Japan had had probably brought the most harm to that country over the last century or so. Yeah. Uh, and so now we're having this this positive meeting about a threat that is is not really real. Could you be more specific? What, what threat do you consider not really real? Well, you know, I, I think when we look at a lot of strategic analysis, one of the things that led uh, China into the South China Sea to, to take uh, a stronger position there was not the desire to harvest more fish or to take oil uh, uh, in contested waters from Vietnam. Uh, and, and on this point, I think Emmanuel's wrong. I think uh, China's relationships with Vietnam have improved uh, over the last few years, and that relationship's being well managed. Uh, but, but to counteract um, uh, what the U.S. has constructed underwater, which is, according to a number of experts, uh, an underwater uh, sonar wall uh, enacted by a submarine strategy that aims to uh, be able to impose a naval blockade at a moment's notice uh, should Washington want one. And China has been struggling. This is a part of its struggle related to the Dalyu, but also in the South China Sea, to push back against uh, these restrictions uh, as a matter of, uh, of self-defense, but the U.S. has characterized this as China taking an aggressive position uh, against its neighbors and drawn uh, the Philippines and Japan into this narrative as uh, strategic partners. Uh, understood. So let's, let's I guess, take, take a step back because we're literally in between two fairly significant events, Yellen in Beijing, uh, in China, and of course we're going into this trial lap between the, the three countries that we just talked about there. The, the former largely positive for relations, the latter I can't seem to think of a scenario where that would uh, put Beijing under a, a, under a favorable light. Net, net next week, do you think, Joseph, how do you think this relationship, are we better or worse off between China and the U.S.? 
Well, you know, I think Gellin made the point that uh, relations now are better than they were a year ago without acknowledging that they were l uh, worse last year due to false assertions uh, regarding an errant weather balloon, assertions that were later uh, conceded were false by the, the Pentagon. Um, but, you know, again, I, I think that um, uh, uh, Yellen, I, I don't see her visit as a positive. I think she came here selling a lie, uh, a lie that uh, Bloomberg itself has suggested is is false with, with regard to overcapacity. Um, and I think she came to, to uh, foreshadow more uh, protectionism and tariffs. And keep in mind, she was doing the same thing in Africa last year, uh, promoting the, the, the disproven uh, story about uh, BRI promoting uh, 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 debt traps. So I think she's become this very effective uh, grandmotherly figure uh, that has uh, attracted some positive um, attention in China, some Chinese admirers, giving her her um, attention to Chinese female colleagues, her appreciation for Chinese cuisine, mm. um, and her genial demeanor when meeting with Chinese officials. But I think her real purpose was to come here and to sow fear, uh, particularly as we uh, are expecting some positive first quarter reporting uh, uh, with uh, the, the Chinese economy, uh, with the understanding that mm. uh, consumer and investor confidence still isn't where it needs to be. And, and I mean, as, you, as you say, she has the charm. Um, she brings the charm. And, and what is her role, do you think, now when it comes to diplomatic relations with China? Is she more the leading face, more so than, than Anthony Blinken now? I think so. I think Blinken uh, has spoiled his image. Uh, you know, they're, they're, we've, we've had so many memes of, of Blinken in China uh, where, where he comes and says something positive and then, and then you know, 10 minutes later or a day later, uh, his message is being undercut uh, uh, by Biden directly. Um, and uh, Blinken himself has, has you know, uh, been someone who's promoted a lot of anti-China discourses, including the, the, the spy balloon nonsense. So I think that uh, he has, um, he's taken more the role of being the lead in, in, in promoting positive relations with countries like Japan, the Philippines, and trying to advance the anti-China narrative in Europe, whereas um, uh, uh, Yellen um, uh, has taken the lead um, here in, um, in China. And, uh, Joseph, to build on your earlier point there, then, do you think Beijing sees through this veneer, this overcapacity mm -hmm. narrative veneer? Absolutely. You know, Beijing uh, uh, knows as well as Bloomberg knows that this is not a real issue. Uh, Beijing said that, uh, you know, the U.S. should examine this uh, issue uh, objectively and, and with an eye to understanding uh, the market. Uh, we all know why the United States isn't competitive in EVs. We know that their legacy automobile industry suppressed the development of that industry for decades. Um, and we know that China has been very open um, and competitive in EVs, uh, especially almost a textbook case uh, uh, with regard to how they welcomed uh, 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 Tesla and others and forced the Chinese EV industry to compete. And that's one of the reasons why it has emerged in the forefront of, of, of uh, uh, the, the, that, that market worldwide. But, you know, the other point here is that, you know, the, Be Beijing is very much aware that this is an election year and that there's a lot of pandering, right? Uh, and that uh, uh, Be uh, Biden uh, needs uh, Michigan. Uh, he's, he's fighting a tough battle. Uh, he needs Michigan. Uh, there are a lot of auto workers there who are afraid of uh, uh, competing with uh, China because they don't have good EV products. And he's pandering to those votes. So, you know, China understands this. Every year that we have an election year with the United States, um, uh, we see uh, China being targeted. So I think China's trying to maintain a positive narrative, trying to still keep to this uh, this positive image that they that they took out of the, the APEC meeting between Xi and Biden late last year, uh, but also trying to avoid getting into a negative discussion, realizing that uh, the real goal here, I think, is to uh, try to convince uh, Europe to come along and to uh, keep moving forward with uh, Chinese EVs, where Chinese EVs do have a foothold. And of course, uh, the tremendous uh, success that EVs, Chinese EVs have had in Australia. So the, the, the real battle here is not right. about the U.S. market. It's about these other markets that the U.S. is also trying to influence.